always reminded that there's a ton of Tupac fans globally, and I want to welcome everybody in the States, overseas, in the entire universe of this edition of Tupac Coach Radio, brought to you by Next Legacy Radio. I am Brandon in the building. Glad everybody's here, tuned in on this ML King holiday to talk legacy, to talk um, not just Tupac legacy, but just hip-hop culture and a lot of stuff that is tied to it. And I think it will be dope just to be able to have a guest that I have uh, to hang out with us to kind of give us some conversation. And with a lot of the DVD that he kind of helped usher in as a director as well, but just some of the stuff that we see out in general when it comes to uh, the, the death of not just uh, Tupac but Biggie and how they are intertwined and how they will probably remain that way, not just being uh, unsolved uh, murders, but um, also just the legacy as far as what, what these two gentlemen have. But we're going to spotlight Tupac, obviously, uh, talking about not just the, the 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 DVD that this man is actually coming out. This will be the third installment of the uh, Tupac assassination battle for Compton. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about that uh, as much as he possibly can. We're going to talk about Mr. Frank. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Death Row Records. We're going to talk about Tupac being in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we're going to talk about Tupac's movie that's coming out on his birthday. Uh, this year. It's going to be a very active, active opportunity for uh, all the listeners out there to listen in globally. So it's going to be a cool look. And, uh, you know what I'm saying? Got to say what's happening to my man, Mr. R. J. Bond, who's listening, who's, who's live with me, but not just that, he's live with a lot of people, I guess, stayed up, like, because, you know, it's, it's different time zones uh, overseas, RJ. So you got a lot of people in Japan and Australia listening in, too, sir. So welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I, I, I got to tell you, until the end of time, that that's the unreleased mix. I heard that, and it's great because we just interviewed Daryl Harper yesterday. And for all of you who don't know, that background vocal that was on that was Daryl Harper and Heard Him Bad doing that together on Until the End of Time. But great bump in that one. I enjoyed that. One of, one of my all-time favorites, the unreleased one, like, you know, I had to make sure that I played that, ran that, let the people know this is the unreleased one, and this is my all-time favorite because it, it takes a sample from the the the, the still doing it, still iconic figure that is Stevie Wonder. So uh, you know, it yep. takes that love, loves in need, uh, which is to me one of the one of the one of the best album songs in the key of life, one of the best songs ever, and it kind of intertwined that so. You know, there's a lot of history when it comes to certain songs that Tupac has done. So, I mean, it's 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 dope having you here, RJ. Man, how's how's everything? You know what? It's really good, man. I could say we're at a a really good spot. And greetings to all the fans all over the world. Um, I'm flattered and honored and privileged that you took the time out of your schedule to listen to uh, to what we're going to talk about. So, you know, just thanks for having me, man. Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off by um kinda kinda tapping into something that I know you can probably give us a little bit as far as an insight. So, uh, you know, I know this uh the the, the Tupac assassination stuff that you've done, you've 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 put out two um you put out two installments. The third one will be coming out very, very soon. Um, can we can we get well, can we start giving out like the, the, the pre order links and things like that, or is that something that we have to hold off for uh for right now no 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 you can definitely uh, uh my distributor would be very happy if you did um uh they're on amazon you can order them through amazon.com and i'm sure there's a amazon uk and an amazon japan uh that you can pre-order those they they are up for pre-order so i'm you know go ahead please give those links out well hell yes then so in that case all night tonight we'll be bumping make sure you go ahead and pre-order Tupac Assassination 3, Battle for Compton. Make sure you go ahead and grab it. Pre-order it. iTunes. Do it now. Not iTunes. Excuse me. Amazon. Go get it. Go Amazon. pre-order it. Make sure that, guys and girls, you get this, this third installment. Um, if you can, RJ, tell us a little bit briefly about just this third installment. And it's obviously different than the previous two. But, you know, just a little bit before we start talking about some other stuff, what will this have that will change okay. the landscape of how people will foresee uh, these DVDs to be? Well, when we 
did the first assassination movie, you know, we sat down and we tried to be really bullet point about things that happened and really wanted to lay out a roadmap of what we believed at the time was, was the means, motive, and opportunity, you know, for certain individuals to do the things that they did. And when we did Assassination 2, we wanted to bend it a little bit because it wasn't so much about the, the, the murders themselves, but so much how it affected the people around Tupac. And, you know, we're the only movie that ever shot out at the Tupac Shakur Foundation. We're the only movie mm-hmm. that the family has come out and watched. Uh, the family came out at the Atlanta Film Festival, Spaghetti Junction, and came out for a screening of the movie. Uh, you know, those are some things that we have a, a great distinction of, of most of the documentaries about Pac that are out there. And that was due to Frank's relationship with the family, and I believe because, you know, when you tell the truth, that's just what resonates with people. So mm. we set that all up, and, and for a period of, of some time, you know, we took a step back and let watch the waters flow. Just let's see how the river ran, see how people reacted to it, see what shook out, see what new leads would come up. And there were a lot of new leads that came up. And, and so Assassination 3, it's been 10 years since the first assassination came out. And we felt like, you know, things run in trilogies. You know, you see part one, part two, part three. And we just said, right. you know what, for part three, let's, let's just burn the house down. And that's mm-hmm. what's going to happen in this movie. We're going to burn the house down. And, and when and, you say, uh, yeah, no, I was going to say, RJ, when you say burn the house down, are you talking about information that has not been volleyballed around? And I say that really in, in, in those terms, because, you know, there's a lot of documentaries out there, as you well know, there's a lot of speculation, as you well know, there's a lot of stuff out there that uh, people say they know, but do they really know? Do they really go behind the scenes and do some investigating and, Killing that onion, I guess you could say. So this third installment will will kind of change that, right? Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Not only do we have a lot of facts in here, but, you know, we back up everything we do with documents, witness testimony. I mean, we're, we don't just casually put some things out there. And recently, a lot of the fans have been putting out a statement that I'd like to, you know, make almost like a chant that I wish everybody would say. And that's enough of Go the talk, it. show me the doc. Enough mm. of the talk. Show me the doc. Let's let's not let's stop speculating and let's get to what we can prove. Let's show me the doc. If you've got something to say or you have a documentary that you come out and you say somebody did something or or this person was responsible for that, uh, you know, okay, that's good. Now show back it up. Show me how you can prove it. I think there's too much speculation and too many people that pretend to be members of 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 ranking, you know, official bodies and that, that put out a lot of disinformation and they just put out information that that's just bullshit, that that's just not true. And they don't, and what's funny about it is that they put it out there and they don't put a single document out to back up what they've said. Like you take Mm -hmm. murder rap, for example, you take a movie like that. There's a lot of stuff that was said in that movie. At the end of the day, how many documents have you ever seen from that? Mm -hmm. How many documents have they ever put out online? Maybe two. And what they did put out, you know, they did a show called Case Closed. It's, it's, on, it's up on the Internet now, but it was on Reels TV. And A.J. Benza, who's a very, very popular investigative journalist, um, you know, he read through the whole Keith Davis statement. And he didn't believe it. And he put that on air. He put that on the air that he didn't think it was credible. So when you look at a document or you look at a documentary you know, the root word being document, right. you should document what you have. And when people publicly call you out to produce the documents that back up what you say happened, you need to do that. So let's – enough of the talk. Show me the doc. Tupac assassination, we, it's three, but we kind of took the three out of it and called it Battle for Compton because it seemed to be a lot on the cover. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so when, RJ, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, because what what you just said makes absolute sense, 100%, because you, you take and you mention Murder Rap. There's a lot of other documentaries that have been out and has surfaced since, uh, you know, you know, ever since, you know, the, the, the mid to late 90s, there's always a documentary about something going on with something and things like that. And you mentioned paperwork. Right. You mentioned documents. You mentioned, 
you know, and it's deeper than that. Because me, and, and as a journalist guy and as a, as a fan of Tupac, and I'm looking at certain things face value. So I take it for whatever, whatever it is that they give me. But you just, you just mentioned something that kind of stirs the pot, in my opinion, just for the simple fact that there is, there, when you when you think about what you just said, as far as people to produce paperwork stating that this person said and or did X Y Z in regards to all of this, you you think about that, and the fact that there hasn't been, and I would say there's been a bunch of documentaries over the last what 15 years or so. Um, sure. And I would say what? How many has produced actual documents or paperwork or sworn statements or anything? What, what's the percentage of that? I would say, I would say probably maybe 25, 30% of the documentaries that are out there have managed to produce it. And, and you know, and in some cases, a documentary about Tupac, it, it, if it's not about the investigation, if it's about somebody's personal story, like let's, let's take before I wake, for example, which was Frank mm-hmm. Alexander's story. Right. I wouldn't be expecting I wouldn't be expecting Frank just told his story and I wouldn't be expecting Frank to produce a lot of documents because that was really more about his relationship with Pac, you know. And mm-hmm. so from a documentary like that, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of um, you know, documents and that to back that up. But if you're going right. to, po- to pose yourself as an investigative journalist, Okay, or if mm-hmm. you're going to pose yourself as a law enforcement or ex law enforcement official, and you're going to put yourself out like that, I would expect that those people be held to a higher standard. Now, okay, so for example, you know, we interview Layla Steinberg. Okay, Layla Steinberg says Pac did this, Pac did that. I'm not going to ask right. Layla Steinberg to go get me photos to prove that that's what was said, but right. If I'm going to make allegations that say certain things happened at a certain time, like we'll say, for example, Yakfula. Yakfula mm-hmm. was shot in, in New Jersey, and from the jump, they all started saying that it had absolutely nothing to do with the Tupac shooting, nothing to do with the Tupac shooting. And you still right. hear that to this day. But if you look at the FBI report that came out, I think it was 2004, so it was some time later, maybe seven years later, you look at the report that the FBI made, they went back and they actually re-interviewed the detectives that investigated that murder, and the detectives said point blank that it was done mafia execution style. Okay? It right. wasn't a gun accident like they were playing it up to be and that it was you know, a friendly fire situation. Gee, we're really sorry that that happened, but it had nothing to do with that. The detectives that worked that case came out, and they said, no, it had something to do with death row. And it had something to do with being killed mafia style, execution style, point blank. So these are the things that need to come out. These are the things that separate the fiction from the myth. And and as documentary filmmakers, we're gravely irresponsible to put out an entire two hour documentary saying that, you know, making the claim that 90 percent of the movie people have never seen before or never heard this information. Well, you, your responsibility is to make sure that you have that information backed up and available for scrutiny. I mean, that was why the whole Freedom of Information Act was created in the first place, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, to hold our. So, RJ, are you saying that are, are you saying that uh, that Gaddafi's uh, death had it, it was it was tied to it in some way, shape, or form? But they, meaning the not just the media, but the you know the law enforcement, just really didn't. They, they they really didn't actually see it through all the way till well you know it's not the end right now but you know see it all the way through period. Yeah, the, I, well the answer the short answer to that question is yes, but it isn't so much what I said. Again, as a documentary filmmaker, you're supposed to be pretty transparent. You're supposed to let the facts talk for themselves. You know you don't right. make up a story and say we figured it out. It's this guy, Professor Plum use the candlestick in the library and and I already made that up and you should just believe me because that's what I'm telling you as a documentary filmmaker you watch any good documentary you know like a Michael Moore documentary or some other documentary that it, you know is really good they just kind of lay lay it out they just lay it mm-hmm. out and you know 
they're transparent. It's not about an agenda. It's not about I'm going to prove to you that that what I say is true. You know, Michael right. Moore is great about that when he puts out a documentary where he just kind of tells some stories and gives some stories about some people, and then you draw the conclusions based on what he's given you. But right. you can't do it the other way around. You can't say I'm going to prove to you X because I figured it out, and you just need to believe me. We need to be transparent. Qaddafi, I didn't say Qaddafi was related to the death row thing. The detectives said that, and the mm. FBI said that. And all I need to do as a documentary filmmaker is bring that forward, right. and that's all that we need to do. So you really, with a documentary filmmaker, you got to get yourself out of the way. You got to get out of your own way and get your ego out of the way. And as and as a documentary, uh, uh, you know, not just person that is facilitating it, directing it making sure everything is kind of lined up and layered out. I think you made a perfect point by saying that you got to put your ego, uh, you got to put your ego aside and it's bigger than just you because I mean, RJ, I don't know about you, but I think, you know, the death of Tupac is until literally there's a smoking gun, meaning that, you know, it's been many years since that has and will happen and it hasn't happened. I think until that literally, or there's videotape footage of it, I think people are going to be uneasy or they're going to be unnerved by this death, not just because it's unsolved because of who it is, but because of the manner in which the the Vegas and L.A. police departments and anybody that's that investigated and it's got problems. I mean, you know, everybody says, especially back then, death row had L.A. cops on the payroll. Uh, they had so many different things that was tied to it. It, it was It was – done at a point in time where literally it was like in the 90s from especially when death row rose so quickly the rise and and fall of and just they just made it feel like it was mafia type so i want to ask you this as far as as far as that goes just observation when you look at everything and when you heard from everything i want to ask you uh is is this something that people will never seem to let go based on what I just said, or is it just something that after they look at your documentary, which will be, which will be coming soon, and, uh, and just the facts, people are going to say, okay, they can kind of come to their own conclusion, regardless as if there's a court trial or anything like that. Well, you know what? That's a, that's a, a, a great question. It's got a few points to it. Um, I'm going to break two of those off. The first one is, you know, Frank and I said this at the screening of Tupac assassination. We have screened it. We've said this a thousand times. Number one, it doesn't matter what I think. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter what I think. I'm, I put the information out there, and I could be wrong. I mean, you know, um, and I'd be the first one to say uh, it's interesting to me that people are still chasing us down uh, over a ten-year-old, uh, a ten-year-old belief, uh, right. where you know we said that you know we said that. We drew a dotted line to Suge Knight, and you know he had means and motive and opportunity. But later on, when we came to get new information, and the and the case started to evolve a little bit, and we started to re-examine Suge Knight's involvement in the case, and this was in our book Tupac 187. Um, right. When we started to do that, you know that changed. But as long as you're not painting yourself into any corners, then you have the liberty. And you know I talk to a lot of detectives that say, and they say it all the time. You know, you go down a path. And you know what? A good detective will learn if you've gone down a path and it isn't working out or it's not right, you say, okay, that's not right. Let's go back and let's go back to the beginning and let's rewalk it again. And you do that over and over again because until somebody's in front of a judge and somebody's convicted, I hate to quote from the 70s, but it ain't over till it's over. Okay. <laughs> um, right. I feel you. So, you know, you know so, so that, that's the first part of it. And, and the, the second part of your question is, is, I think the more global, and I'm so glad that it's Martin Luther King Day because you know Martin Luther King was very outspoken about this. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely, you know, a, a big a, a big theme of what what Dr. King had out there was you know when you go to sleep at night, what is it that you want to believe? You know, I have a dream. When you go to mm-hmm. sleep at night and you look at the world around you, what kind of world do you want to envision for yourself? And and this. This comes to a question of what I would call a convenient truth or a convenient or an inconvenient truth in this particular. Let's say, for example, and I'm just throwing it out there because it just happened to be the discussion, I think, when you interviewed Detective Kading about this, about you know cops being involved in the whole story about 
undercover, uh, not undercover, off-duty cops working for death row records and LAPD working right. for death row records. And, and you know, even the, the security company being run by cops, um, you know, when you go to bed at night, part of the reason I think that the alternate theories, maybe about Orlando Anderson or a single shooter or a gang war, I think that those exist a lot because when you go to sleep at night, do you really want to believe that there are crooked cops all over the place or that crooked cops would be able to, I won't say they did it, but to participate in it or be any part of what was going on, that right. that there is a, a crooked legal system out there? You know, Dr. King addressed these very thoughts many times, you know, the belief in the government, the belief in that. and. And you have to ask yourself, when you go to sleep at night, what would you rather believe? And I think that a lot of people publicly are willing to believe, even if it's not true, they're willing to convince themselves that it is because it helps them sleep better at night. Right. And 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 so when Assassination Battle for Compton comes out, we're going to push some inconvenient truths on people. And I, I I don't think that people are going to come out of the movie uh, happy. I think they'll come out of the movie changed, but I don't think that they're going to come out of the movie happy because we put out some some truths that that are just inconvenient, and mm. uh, so you have to get your head wrapped around that. But I think how much more appropriate we talk about inconvenient truths. Dr. King did nothing but talk about inconvenient truths. Right. In challenging the system, right. you know, and what what people were willing to accept at that time, you know, the okie doke, and and you have to change your way of thinking and be willing to accept for change for real change to occur, you have to be willing to accept an inconvenient truth, and then deal with wow. it. Wow, wow. R. J. Bond, director of Tupac Assassination, Volume One, Volume Two, Volume Three, Battle for Compton. Pre-order it right now. You go to Amazon.com. It is available to pre-order. Do it. Do it now. I did it earlier today. I want everybody to do it because this will change the perception that a lot of people have from watching other documentaries and documentaries that literally just came out or was promoted as well. And and I'm, I'm standing corrected also. Just some of the stuff that I talked to you about um, off air and some of the stuff in general that, I'm really starting to pay attention to. I mean, I may be a young journalist, but I'm young enough to know, like, hey, you know what, this this needs to be revisited, or we need to see this again just so I can be able to have another uh, fresh pair of eyes, fresh pair of ears, just so I can see and hear certain things as well. And um, and I want to ask you how, how you know, you know, I will still continue to say no Frank Alexander because even though he has passed, everybody, you know, knows of him, but you knew him. So I want you to talk to the, the listeners a little bit about your relationship with Frank. Well, I think that, that you know, we we talked about and in, and in, in my, my writing and producing partner, Mike Carlin, actually, he said this to me one day we were sitting there, and he said, you know, R.J., if anybody has standing to talk about these issues, it's definitely you because you weren't an outside journalist just looking in at everything. You weren't, uh, you know, somebody who picked up a magazine one day and said, hey, I'd really like to write about this subject, and you just started writing. Uh, I met Frank Alexander in 1997. Uh, I met him just immediately after the events in Las Vegas happened. Um, so I was there during the time that Frank – was working through those issues. Frank and I lived together. We shared a house. Uh, Frank and Frank is was the godfather. I keep saying is because I, I miss him greatly. You know, Frank was the godfather to my eldest son. Um, you know, there wasn't a day that went by that Frank Alexander and I didn't talk on the phone two, three times. And and so um, I, you know, I was there with him n- during that entire time. I was privy to phone calls that were made. I actually have uh, possession of many of the recorded phone calls that Frank Alexander made with people that were calling in from Death Row Records at that time and Chuck Phillips at that time. And several of those recordings are actually in Assassination 3. Uh, you'll get to hear some, some things that you know some people have put out there that, that actually disprove those things. But my relationship with Frank, we were like brothers. And because of that relationship that I had with Frank, 
I was basically grandfathered into an inner circle of people that most outsiders would never have had uh, uh, this level of access. I mean, from the day that we talked to Muta Beal. I mean, you know, I showed up at, at his house with Frank, and we went together, and we interviewed Muta, who's Napoleon from the Outlaws, by the way. You know, he's, mm-hmm. he's over, owns a coffee shop, I think, over in Dubai now. He's not even in the States yep. anymore. But, yep. um, but you know, from that to, to Layla Steinberg, uh, to Tracy Robinson, to the the people glow glow I mean his aunt I mean you know she just doesn't do interviews with people and and the exposure that we got you know you don't just walk in especially in a situation like that you don't just walk into an interview with a list of questions and say here these are the bullet point questions I want to ask you mm-hmm. you talk and like glow for example uh, I probably published 20 minutes total of of interview time but I've got almost eight hours of of interview there okay. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. where and what did we talk about? You know what we talked about? We talked about Pac. We talked about Pac's life. We talked about who he was, what he wanted to do, how he treated his family, how he treated his cousins. You know, when I talked to Layla, Layla, did, you know, it wasn't a series of bullet point questions. Layla was nervous, and but she talked about Pac. She talked about what Pac wanted to do when he was up in Marin City, what he wanted to right. do, what he saw as his future. Um, I, you know, I did a big interview with Shock G. I haven't released it, but I did a major interview with Shock G and Humpty. And uh, when we talk about that, you know, Shock talked a lot about Pac. But you just, with my level of involvement with the estate, with the friends and family of Pac, you just don't go in there like an investigative journalist with a list of questions and you shoot your questions off and you're done. These are people that you have real honest sit down questions with and that helps you get to the bottom of things very quickly and I think it was because of my relationship with Frank and because of Frank but more importantly it was because of those people's belief in Frank there's a lot of people want to run Frank down want to say he wasn't honest they want to say that he wasn't truthful with Pac he wasn't that I I I would be hard pressed to find a guy who would be more upset if he knew somebody was lying about something than Frank. Now I can't right. say that Frank never lied. We know that that Frank was asked to lie to the police uh, mm-hmm. at the from the moment that Pop got shot. He was asked to lie. He was asked by Reggie Wright to lie to the police, mm-hmm. and and so we know that he did. So it, you know you can't say that Frank never lied, but every single one of us has lied. Let's be honest. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so so to take one or two events and use that to define a man, I think is wholly unfair. And I think that Pac's family, Pac's friends, his closest friends, Tracy Robinson's closest friends, business partners, they saw Frank as a man of good character, of good moral character, and they were willing to help him out on a project he was doing. And more important, they were more than willing to help him keep looking for the truth wherever that truth might take us. Wow. What was his what was his relationship as far as just your conversations that you had with Frank? What was his relationship with Shug Knight? Well <laughs> um well I'll tell you let me tell you there there were it was a complex relationship. Okay. The at first, and I, I, you know, I think Mr. Kading said something, and I, and I won't disagree with him about this. It is probably one of the few things, if anything, that I would that I would disagree with him about. But All right. you know, as people learn information, as new things come around, and people gather more insight and more information, and, and more importantly, more clarification about stuff, it's okay to alter your opinion or change your perspective on what what it is you've been presented and and how that affects what you've been thinking for some time. So I think that Frank and a lot of the security guards were very naive. You know, they worked for Reggie Wright. They worked for the head of the security company. That was what they knew. And they had their experiences and their conversation with Pac and all that. But at the end of the day, I would not have expected Frank Alexander being the security guard working at the studio to know the intricate financial business relationship between Reggie Wright and Suge Knight. Okay. Mm-hmm. You, you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense to you? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So 
Yeah, so – but as time goes by, he's not working for death row. Years go by. Death row bankruptcy gets filed. He starts seeing the intermingling financially between Reggie and Suge, or he starts seeing other things and talking to other people, and he learns more about what was going on behind the scenes. Well, his feelings about Suge Knight changed, and they became worse because at the end of the day, you know, when you're the CEO of a company, you know, the buck stops there. It stops right. with you. Suge Knight was the one who put Reggie Wright in charge of security, and if there was a failure of security in any way, shape, or form, you know, that's the fault of the head of the security company. And mm-hmm. so if you're a guard and you're not getting the guns or the radios or the equipment that you need, I mean, you know, you can't go down to Radio Shack and buy another radio if you know you right. don't have one. You know, if you're the head of the security company and Suge's responsible for that, Frank started to hold Suge accountable. He didn't blame him. He didn't say he was responsible for the murder. We said that he had motive and opportunity. Sure, sure did, and that still stands. But mm. he held Suge accountable, and I'm going to draw a good parallel to this. Much similar to the way that Pac held Biggie accountable for what happened to him in New York. Pac didn't say that Biggie shot him. Pac never said that, and, and no one's ever right. said that. But, he, but right. he held Biggie responsible for it because he felt that Biggie should have been on his guard. He knew New York. He was a guest, and that Biggie should have protected him better or at least not put anybody in the situation that they got themselves into. And mm-hmm. so when Frank changed his point of view about Suge, and about Suge's involvement with it, it made him very angry, and he became more angry about it. And it was in 2000 and – I want to say it was 2008. That could have been 2009. I'll double-check, but I think it was 2008. Frank and I went to a convention in Las Vegas called The Magic Show, and that was a fashion show that's the biggest fashion show in the United States, and it's in Las Vegas. And all the designers come there to show off all their clothes. Well, Frank was actually bodyguarding a very famous designer that had a whole line of clothing at that time, and he was one of the guards that was assigned to be there at that magic show. And uh, as usual, because Frank had concealed carry permits in California and Nevada, much people don't believe that, but it's true, uh, mm-hmm. he, he was fully armed. He had a gun on his side and a gun in his uh, at his ankle, and uh, he was there protecting the owner of that company well so i was there i had come with him made the ride up there and as always we were joined at the hip so i'm just hanging out with frank while he's doing his bodyguard work well somebody comes running up to frank and whispers something in frank's ear and i've never seen frank's face change from happy to serious so quickly and frank i said frank was wrong and he said somebody just come and told me that suge is in the other aisle and Suge's coming this way. And I said, okay, what do you want to do about that? He said, that end comes anywhere close to me and even looks me in the eye. I will shoot him dead on the spot right this moment. I will kill him. And I had never heard mm-hmm. Frank say those words in knowing him for 10, 11 years. I had already known him by that time. I had never heard him say that. But I know for a fact he would have dropped Suge Knight. Amazingly enough, Suge decided to turn left rather than turning right, did not come down our aisle, and that situation diffused itself. Now, me wow. being the you know guy that I am, I tried to make light of the situation. I told Frank, I said, well, if you're going to do that, let me go grab my camera first, okay? <laughs> All right. All right. You know, well, what valuable so, footage that would have been, right? I could have sold that to TMZ exactly. in a minute, I think. Oh, yeah, TMZ so, would have loved that one. They would have ate that up real yeah, quick. But, so, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, that was the level, that was the level of, of, of responsibility and liability that he placed on Suge for putting any of them in that situation and, and in any way, shape, or form getting away with it or anything that he thought at that time. But I'm here to tell you and tell all the fans out there, there was probably 30 feet away from Suge Knight being killed in Las Vegas by Frank Alexander. Wow. And he was happy. Wow. He said if he got shot, it was okay. It was his day to go. 
And if he went to jail for the rest of his life, he said he could go with it with a mind that was at peace. Wow. Wow. That was true. RJ, let me, let, let me ask you this, because, you know, processing this to me, especially like, you know, everything that, that has transpired prior to uh, Pox passing and, and, he, and afterwards, it, it always takes a lot of us who is diehard uh, fans and supporters of the Tupac legacy. We all, we all like, you know, it, you know, every time, every time I talk to you, RJ, I just kind of process stuff. Like I had to think about a lot of stuff that when we had our conversation a, a couple days ago, but I'm, I'm over here thinking, and, and a lot of it just has to do exactly why Frank was just so irate with Suge with just the simple fact that he dropped the ball, right? I mean, you know, I think we all, we all understand the fact that something as far as security wise that night in Vegas fell so far off that, you know, there's a lot of resentment that I think a lot of Pac fans have against that security uh, group and should, and, and not Frank, but uh, Reggie White and uh, just in general, just like a lot of people just kind of is unnerved by it. But I think Frank was irritated of the fact that he dropped the ball and, let Pac die, literally, right? Well, I mean, here's the thing. You know, when you work for a company, you do what that company tells you to do. That's what you do when you're employed. And there right. might have been a situation where Frank might have been able to speak up and say, let me go get my gun that was in the car, you know, when they got to the Lexer Hotel. And I know cops, I know people that probably would have said, and again, I'm speculating, but that, that would have said, I'd rather not be a bodyguard, and I would rather not do this job. In fact, I'm going to walk away from this job because you're not giving me a gun. You're not giving me a radio, and you're asking me to protect, at that time, one of the biggest superstars on the planet. And you are and you are putting me in a dangerous situation, and I'm just not going to do it. You go find somebody else to be a fool because you're sending me on a fool's errand. And unfortunately – you know, for whatever reason, Frank, I think it was his commitment to Pac because they were friends. Frank decided no matter what the circumstance and no matter what the disadvantage that he was going to do his absolute best. I think that over the course of time, you know, there, there and I, I'm, I was there. There's, there wasn't one time that Frank and I didn't go someplace that we didn't hear somebody make fun of Frank or somebody say that Frank was the worst bodyguard ever. Or say that Frank wow. didn't do his job, Pac is dead because he didn't do his job. I'll tell you, we went on the Wendy Williams show. Okay, we went there in 2007, in November. We went on the Wendy Williams show before she was on TV. This was on she was on radio. Mm-hmm. And Frank and I did an interview because we were doing a press screening of assassination in New York, in Times Square. And when we did that on that show, Frank had his headphones like everybody does when they get a radio show, you can hear the person, the main person, but you don't always hear all of the other channels of things that are going on. And Frank had his headphones tuned to where he could only hear a couple of things, but mine was turned to where I could hear everything because Frank was talking. And during the entire right. time that Frank was accounting for what happened in Las Vegas, these fools were playing sound effects. They were goofing on them. They were playing sounds of somebody shooting themselves in the foot. They were playing these sounds like Frank was uh, – basically a joke and they made light of the whole situation and i think when you're a security bodyguard and you're responsible for someone's life especially your friend and you watch them die and they die on your watch i think that's probably one of the most tasteless things anybody could do would be to make fun of you in that because of how much you must have felt in that grave responsibility you had so i can tell you that there was one point in time when people weren't taking cheap shots at Frank and weren't saying that he did a bad job. But in my opinion and and in Frank's as well, you know, he was set up that way. He was set, you know, they call it, you know, set up to fail. He was set up to fail. There was nothing he could do. And he, you know, you could live with that for a certain period of time. But when you have fools coming out of crowds and saying you're a, a bad bodyguard or you didn't do your job or you didn't do this. And Reggie coming out recently saying that nonsense at the end of the day, you got to look to who his upline was and who put him in that situation. Death Row Records was worth a half a billion dollars at the time. You yep. can't buy extra radios. You can't go down to Radio Shack and make sure you have bunches of radios so if anybody needs them, there's an extra one floating around. Please. 
you know. See, and that, and RJ, I think that's the that's the thing that a lot of uh, a lot of the fan base and a lot of media people and a lot of people in general is 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 really just kind of like you know pressed on the fact that you know uh, you just mentioned the fact that Death Row Records was it. It was the it was the hip hop Motown uh, of of the nineties. It, it, it took everything by storm. The money was flowing. Everything was 100% when it, come, when it came to the success uh, of that record label. And a lot of people to this day, like you mentioned, like that had to, that had to have a hell of a toll on Frank after Pac died. And literally there was so much in his head as far as, you know, I don't know. I don't know the guy. So, you know, you do. So just a mental wear down of just that in general, man, like that, that had to take a toll on him emotionally and lose sleep and all that stuff, uh, for a lot of years of his life. Right. Yeah, it did. Uh, it did. It, it, I called, I always, I never told Frank this to his face, but anybody I would ask me about Frank, I would say that Frank, Frank was a tortured soul. You know, Damn. you, you live, you relive that memory in your mind over and over again when you go to sleep and you you still think to yourself, what could I have done? What could I have done differently? What if I hadn't have done that? What if I, you know, a lot of people don't know this about Frank. It doesn't go talked about very often. But, you know, Frank saved Snoop and the Dog Pound in New York when cars came by and opened fire on that trailer that they were in. He got them all out of that mm-hmm. trailer. Mm-hmm. You know, Frank was a hero. Suge would run around saying, Frank, they're calling you a hero now because he saved all of them. He saved their lives. And so when you have a guy that goes from that to having the biggest rap star in the world killed while you're in, responsible for him, that's a hell of a fall. Yeah. So, you know, and forget the fact that, you know, I, I, like I said, because I love Frank, I'll, I'll, I'll tell, still tell it straight. Frank had an ego, okay? He was, you know, Mr. Universe bodybuilder and the whole thing. He had an ego. <laughs> right, So right. You know. So, so even more so for somebody who had any kind of an ego to think that there was anything they could have done and been the, still been the hero, um, you know, uh, th- that that tortured Frank, and it really did. And uh, and I, I still I still believe to this day that 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 he never he never let go of that. Yeah, and and I don't blame him, and I don't blame you for you know, uh, going as hard as you can to preserve his legacy and, and let everybody, every media outlet, let people know in general what type of guy he is. And I think that needs to be not just brought out, but also the, the, the dark side of Death Row Records at that particular time started to rear, rear its ugly head. And, you know, as a as big a fan of Death Row Records I had, like, I, I literally, and you know, it's just me as a media guy based on my opinion, and how I feel, like I always felt Suge Knight was responsible for the 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 crumble death of Death Row Records, in my opinion, just for the simple fact that um, he took that business that could have done so much for communities, inner city communities. The the music business probably wouldn't be as as stained as it is now if he would have ran a proper. Uh, organization at that particular time, people would probably still be alive. I'm going to keep it 100%. It, it would be a whole different deal if he would have ran it the right way as opposed to the mafia-style way that he uh, literally ran it into its demise. Yeah, I think I, I think that, that you're right. Without saying too much about it, you know, we actually talk about that in the new movie. We talk about okay. Suge's Shug, authority. We talk about Shug's some of the uh, you know some of the constraints you know that Shug had. I mean, it's no secret that Death Row was founded by drug money. It was founded by Harry O and David Kenner owned half of Death Row Records. I mean, you know, right. you got a mob attorney running Death Row Records with you, and you got uh, a mob uh, drug kingpin or a drug mover in prison giving you money to start a record label. You know it. <laughs> It kind of goes along with it that there are going to be mobbish things happening around there. So, yeah. you know, even if even if Suge decided that that wasn't the cool way to go and go with the flow, you know, that influence, you know, and way of, of life is, is, is going to be there. And I think that it's a very powerful drug, power, money, you know, greed, 
those are all very powerful drugs and very powerful emotions that could make you do things that maybe you wouldn't do. I mean, you know, I, I hear things about Suge in the same breath I hear those bad things about Suge that I you know that he did and I'm sure that he did. But at the same time, I you know, I heard a story, you know, with Daryl Harper yesterday where, where Suge Knight said to Daryl Harper, he's back there mixing beets and he's eating popcorn and he doesn't have anything else to eat but popcorn. But he's mixing beats because he's just trying to earn himself a reputation, and Shug stopped him in the hallway and said, what's in your pockets, man? How are you doing? What's, what do you got? And he said, you know, Shug, I'm having hard times right now. I'm eating popcorn and drinking soda refills at the fountain machine because they're free, uh, but, you know, that's it. Shug says to him, you know what? That ain't going to happen anymore. You stop by the office tomorrow. I have a check for you. Give him $1,000 that next day, Okay. Mm-hmm. That was the guy. Suge Knight was the guy that was giving out, you know, turkeys and at Thanksgiving time to the people in Compton. You know, yeah. so you hear these things and you try to rationalize in your mind, well, how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile this guy that does these terrible things and holds a girl at knife point in Vegas and does the things that he does with this same guy who was generous enough to do these things for people? And yet, and and the only way I can reconcile is to say, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolutely. And 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 and, and look at it this way, RJ. I look at it like this because you you mentioned the fact that Suge has done a lot of good things in communities, turkeys, and everything, and it, it sounds great. But I, I think you and I know that uh, you know that that's. Sometimes you gotta you gotta figure out or you gotta understand is it done because it's done from the from the kindness of their hearts or or is there an agenda attached to it? I think I think if we go through the history of a lot of uh, I guess you could say corrupt guys and not just the the business of of music but the drug business uh, you know the, the whatever business that's not legitimate. Like I think Al Capone yep. did that too. I think he gave uh, he gave a lot of good goodwill to a lot of neighboring people and shit like that, right? Like I, I know yep. uh, I know a lot of mob bosses in, in in a lot of different cities and states and things like that gave a lot of free turkeys away and did a lot of things. And it is it is to a T, RJ, that you can yep. say that a lot of what should did had a heavy 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 tie to what a lot of mob bosses had has done throughout uh, history. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you, I, I will agree with you 1 million percent on that. But again, that's not to say I'm not I, – I unfortunately can't jump in somebody's head and question their motives. But I, no but I can tell you that to Daryl Harper, that made all the difference in the world, okay? Yep. Yep. And, and, and to, to somebody who didn't have a turkey at Thanksgiving, whatever motive that Suge Knight had for doing what he did, those kids that got to eat a turkey dinner that day that wouldn't have had one – do you think they care? They didn't care. They were just glad oh, that they definitely. had it. Exactly. So, so that, that's I, and that's and that true. and that's what puzzles people, and that will always puzzle people, I think, to the end of time, because a lot of people that knew, and Pac was kind of the same way. You know, they had this Gemini quality where, for every good story you'd hear about Pac, you'd hear some negative. You know, and mm-hmm. and everybody's mm-hmm. got that. I think to some degree, you know, I have my good no days, doubt. I have my bad days. You know, ask my wife about right. me; she'll probably tell you the same thing. You know, she'll say, "Oh, <laughs> you know." Like, what are you saying good things about RJ for? He didn't take out the trash last night like I asked him to, you know, <laughs> things like that. No doubt, no doubt. So, no, I hear you, I of, hear you. RJ Bonds, our, <laughs> that's true. RJ Bonds, our guest, Tupac Legacy, brought to you by Next Legacy Radio. You can make sure that you pre-order Tupac Assassination 3, Battle for Compton. It's available uh, for pre-order right now. You can go and pre-order it. I said it earlier. I did mine. I suggest everybody go and do this, too. If you are a Tupac fan, this will change the scape of how you foresaw other documentaries. So I encourage everybody to uh, to go out and pre-order it right now. And we'll continue to do that all the way until it's released, which it looks like it's going to be late February, early March. So I definitely uh, encourage everybody to go ahead and pre-order it now. Do it while you can, because I'm telling you, this will definitely be the hottest, uh, the hottest straight to uh, DVD, Blu-ray uh, that you're going to get in 2017. I, I guarantee you that. And um, let me ask you, RJ, about the the legacy of of, of Tupac. And 
Um, that I've always struggled and I've always thought about just the, you know, especially with Afeni's passing and even before, that Tupac's legacy, in my opinion, not just music-wise, because the music business is all fucked up right now. It's just, in my opinion, mm-hmm. it's just, you know, it's it's on it's on its uh, last legs, in my opinion, as far as just the way and the manner that music is promoted and marketed and um, and even done for the most part. But looking at his legacy, not just his music legacy, but his entire body of work, I feel like um, as fans and as media, we let him down a little bit to a degree. But the resurgence that I think a lot of people are starting to get as far as educating themselves on Tupac and his music and his history and what he stood for has been uh, resurrected, I guess you could say, by the fact that he is now an inductee of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which props up top for that being done. And also the movie yeah. that's coming out on his birthday, which is uh, which is highly anticipated and highly speculated that, you know, it, it will go either way. It would either be a very good movie or it will be a very bad movie. There's no gray area when it comes to that, though. So what's your opinion about Pac's legacy, and, and, and what's your take on what you see in general just for, uh, you know, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and this movie that's coming out? What, what, what's your vibe that you get in general as far as how you feel about Tupac's legacy? Well, let me let me start by saying that the uh, great observations, everything. I mean, I, I, I almost could repeat everything you said verbatim, you know, uh, in terms of of the uh, you know of of what I believe, but you know, it, it, to me, it's all about timing. You know, they they say they say that about everything in life. You know, it's about timing, being at the right place at the right time. If you look at Tupac's music and Tupac's life and his death, I mean, that was 1996. So here we are, 20 years later. You know, if if you were 10 when that all went down or younger, you'd only be in your late 20s, maybe 30 years old. So mm-hmm. there's an entire generation of people who not only don't know who Tupac was, they're not familiar with his music. All they know is it's, and it's kind of sad because we see this a lot with John Wayne or we see it with Marilyn Monroe or, you know, uh, Charlie Chaplin. We see, you know, see this with, with figures that – you know, are bigger than life, and then they die, and they somehow become a cartoon. They become kind of a caricature of themselves. You know, right. let's save. You know, you hear that a lot. You know, it's like, and 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 I really don't know that people know who Tupac was as a person. Uh, I worked with Adrian Gregory, who was his manager on a movie called Tupac: The Early Years. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Lord willing, that's going to come out whenever Adrian decides it's going to come out. Lord willing, it'll come out soon. Um, but You know, the entire movie was about Tupac before he went to death row and what he was like before he went to death row. And 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 that gives you so much insight. And I I wish for this generation of people, anybody under 30 years old, that just all they see is, you know, California love or a a drawing of Pac, you know, throwing up his middle finger. That wasn't what he was about. So, again, a timing, I think, is everything. I think it's time that. That a new generation of people be exposed to his music and that, and and that's where you're going to really see his legacy. Because if you're not around, but your music and your story and what you stood for still exists and still resonates with the next generation, then you mm-hmm. have a legacy. Let's draw this back. What are we celebrating today? MLK. You know, you talk about a legacy. He's been long gone, but his thoughts. His feelings, his speeches, things he said, they resonate with each new generation. So when you talk about what I think about Pac's legacy, I think it's only getting started because we're in the first generation of people who didn't know him or weren't necessarily around. You know, they didn't wear the parachute pants and, you know, didn't have their hair spiked up. I did. I didn't have my hair hair spiked up, but. I had yeah. to ask Carol, though. I had to, I had to ask Carol, but... Yeah, they... <laughs> <laughs> had the fade, had the fade. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, yep. Gumby, the Gumby hairdo at the time. Oh, yeah, we you know, oh yeah, we rocked that heavy, no doubt. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. So so when you, when you look at that, you know, for those that weren't there, I think the biopic coming along is going to be a good, uh, a good 
um, a good piece of media for them. Now, now having spoken with the people that that I've spoken to about it, heard some comments about it. Uh, you know, I, I think it's 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 timely and it's going to be good. I don't think anybody should go into the biopic looking for some deep deep dive understanding of of pop. I mean, this ain't JFK where you got a three hour movie and you know you're going to go deep 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 into you know some court case about it or something. This is no this movie. I think I think LT created a movie that plays and I you know again I haven't seen the movie so I, I can't I can't give you the whole thing about it but I can say that from what my understanding is it's kind of like a greatest hits album okay it's going to introduce you to this guy it's going to tell his story to people that have never heard it to people that may have heard parts of it but to try right. to set the story straight even basic and then it will be up to people like you people like me people that want to learn more about him, the way he lived, the way he died, and understand that and take it deeper, take a deep dive, I think that's the starting point. You know, it all, all, all revolutions have to start someplace. And, See, this is, and this is what I'm hoping. This is what I'm hoping, RJ. I'm hoping that this movie, I'm, I'm hoping that it's good. I, I really want it to be, um, part of me really wants it to be not just good, but informative. Like, I think I think yep. all eyes on me. The name of the movie, you know, it, it's gonna it's gonna put us in a in a point in time where it's gonna hover so much around the '90s. Which, if anything, if you're a Tupac fan, you you know that his career really took off way before that, way before that yep. in the history of his mom and the Black Panthers. Like to me, I'm only hoping RJ that they make sure that they. They, they can do whatever it is they want to as far as, you know, the depiction of how things were in the 90s and that process. But make sure that you honor his legacy by making sure that they, they cross that line between his relationship with his mom and his mom with the Black Panthers. I hope they, they mention and spotlight the fact that a lot of his social views and values changed when he moved to the Bay in Marin City, notably, when he linked up with a lot of Bay artists and he really kind of latched on to the, the 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 West Side vibe because, you know, everybody know he's, you know, heavy in the books and he did the State of the Arts out in Baltimore and they we know the history. Yep. But if they, if, they, if they channel that, and they don't have to stay on it for 20, 30 minutes, but give us something to inspire us the fact that, you know what, they, they're going through a process. Now, I know it's hard to do within two or two and a half hours, but if they gloss over the 90s too long, I'm having a problem. <laughs> well, you know, the good news, from what I've heard about it, the good news is, you know, Money Bee's in it, for example. So I know they're right. going to give tribute to Oakland in the Bay, and they're going to give the Digital Underground piece of it some good exposure. Um, dialing it back further, you know, the difference between the narrative, and I can speak to this kind of as a filmmaker, the difference between the Notorious movie, for example, about Big, and the Tupac movie is that the whole story of Notorious basically took place in a very limited geographic area, a very small area. Very true. You know, it didn't, very true. didn't go all over the place. You know, Pac's story yep. is almost like a road trip. It's like a road show. You had the New right. York phase, then you had the Marin City phase, and then you had the L.A. phase, back to New York mm-hmm. for prison, back to L.A., you know, so there was a, a lot of moving parts going on, and right. and so to convey that in a 120 minute film becomes much more complex because you're dealing with, like I said, with the big story. You know, you don't have to move around a lot, so you can spend a little bit more time deep diving into some of the details because you're not having to explain. Okay, now we're in Marin City, and this is how things are, and this is how the culture is, and how it's different. I mean, I, I can only imagine the challenge for the writers of this, to, because I mean, I felt the same way when I was doing the early years, which is just the documentary version of the biopic. But mm-hmm. you know, when you enter a new area, you have to get spend a little bit of time explaining that area, explaining how that influences you, and then and then take it to how it influenced Pop. So it's not right. quite so easy. In the, in the Notorious, you set up New York, you set up the situation, you set it up once, and for another two hours, you don't have to explain it again. In mm-hmm. this particular situation, you don't just have the moving parts of his mother and the back and forth, but you have the why. Why did he move from Baltimore out to Marin City on a on a bus, as he always said, on a bus with a bucket of chicken? 
Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what you know, he said. His mom, his mom <laughs> sent him out to L.A. Uh, out to uh, Marin City on a Greyhound bus and a bucket of chicken. So he, <laughs> you have a lot of explaining to do. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to hate it too much if. In 120 minutes, we get the broad strokes and we don't deep dive too deep because in any good movie, and I'm praying that this is what comes out of Assassination Battle for Compton, uh, somebody that watched it with me, they stopped the movie in the middle of it, and they said, you want to know something that's cool? And I said, what? They said, I haven't watched half the movie because, because I've been sitting here trying to talk to you about it, and we've been talking. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so important about a good movie. A good movie inspires conversation. It gets the conversation started. Right. And that's what I think. And that's it. So if it accomplishes only that, my friend, it's a home run. And 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 if it ties together, and it, I mean, it's gonna <laughs> again. I, and I think you and I both know this to be fact. It's either gonna go one way, or it's gonna either go the other. But it with will, that being yep. said. It will it will inspire conversation. It will inspire dialogue. It will motivate people to have an opinion about it one way or the other. I don't think we're gonna go into this come uh you know what I'm saying, come June thinking that okay, yeah, it was just okay. It's gonna be either or. It's either gonna be good or it's well, not gonna be good. And and, and well, I possibly. and I'm cool with and I'm cool with that though. I'm I'm cool with that just for the simple fact that it's going to get us to talk about it because I feel like everybody that I know and everybody that knows Tupac's music and is diehard wanted to succeed, and they're gonna they're gonna have an open they're gonna have an open mind they're gonna have an open visual once they get into the theaters. Yeah, you know the world of Tupac is the world of polarization. You're on one side or you're on the other. It was never middle ground right. with Tupac. And it reminds mm-hmm. me of a saying an old preacher friend an old preacher friend of mine used to say, "Make them mad, sad, or glad, but make them." And that right. was Tupac. That was Tupac. Make them, make them mad, sad, or glad, but make them. So if this movie is a true testament to Tupac, and the movie comes out where some people like it, some people hate it, some people, you know what? It made them, and that's what I love about it. Straight up. Straight up. Couple of quick more questions with my man RJ Bond. Don't forget, make sure, and we'll say it all all tonight. We'll put it on the website. We'll put it up there. Tupac Assassination Three Battle for Compton available for pre order on Amazon. Make sure you go to Amazon dot com. Type in Tupac Assassination Three or search Battle for Compton. You'll be able to see it. Go pre order it right now. I did it. I I suggest anybody that's a big Tupac fans to go and do it as well and. And, and, and RJ, just for the sake of uh, conversation, I mean, you know, we 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 know uh, we know the rap game is just kind of dry right now. I mean, there will never ever ever in life be another Tupac. But I mean, who, who who's out here now that you can say, hey, you know what, they 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 do good music, or that person does good music. Who who's out here that you listening to right now? Oh man, that's a that's a tough question. You know, the, the problem with when you get old, like I am, is that you tend to listen to older things. Um, you know, and and uh, I uh, I think that there's there's a, there's a couple of artists. I'm, you know what? We're, you're going to ask me another question. I'm going to think about that for a minute. Is that okay? I'll come back to that. <laughs> because because I can tell you because I can tell you, for example, like you know, ain't nothing wrong. You know. Um, any kind of unreleased Tupac stuff, I mean, I like to listen to the unreleased stuff. I like the stuff that, mm-hmm. you know, I prefer something that's got more uh, more age to it, military minds, maybe the original cut of that. You know, those are the things that I listen to. And, and it may be because I've just had my head in this for 10 years that I'm just kind of stuck on stupid that way. You know, I don't, I don't, my periscope doesn't go up enough to look at some of the new stuff. But I'll think about that while you're asking me the question. I'll think about that. I'll think. <laughs> For sure. So, in the next that's question. A tough, that's, a, that's a tough question. <laughs> hey, Al, buddy, that's why I threw it your way because uh, it's a little tough for me to answer as well. I like you. Um, you know what I'm saying? I know we're hovering around the same age or whatnot. So I tend to go backwards as far as listening to my hip hop because. It ain't really, it ain't yeah, really I mean, a whole lot going on right now where I'm like, uh, well, you know, that's uh, what I was I'm saying. struggling. You, you kind of hit that, you hit that on the head when you started. I mean, like, 
Kanye, for example, I mean, you know, I like a lot of his stuff. I like a lot of Eminem stuff. I like a lot of Eminem stuff earlier than I like him There you now, go. But, there you go. You know, but, that, but that's kind of how, you know, how I am. I mean, when I lock on to something, I tend to run with it until it, you know, until it ends. I, you know, I wish I could say that my iTunes was bad. But, you know, Tech Nine's another example. You know, right? Uh, somebody, somebody that 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 I feel is 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 current and, and is uh, somebody that that you know addresses issues. Uh, you know, and and again, for me, I mean, this stuff I like to you know groove in my car too while I'm sitting on the freeway doing stuff like that. Kendrick Lamar is another example. I like stuff I like to groove to, but then I like the stuff that I need to think about. It that leaves me with an impression that I need to think about because you know music is music is a way to convey a feeling and and sometimes I like to, to you know I got plenty of time if I'm commuting in L.A. you have plenty of time to sit in your car you know use your brain for something good think about it you know and maybe it helps you figure it out. I'm, I'm gonna give you a couple of ones too real quick though so I'm gonna give you uh, I'm gonna give you Tribe Called Quest the, the, the very recent release. Of tribe, um, and 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 the recent release of the locks. I think some of the some of the more recent stuff you gotta you gotta look for it to be able to pick and choose some of the stuff. But the release, the recent releases of both those projects, it's pretty legit. For, I would I would just say yeah. you know dive into it, take a listen to it, and see how you like it. But you know I I kind of yeah, grab that from there. So Q Tip Q Tip still doing his thing, you know. Still oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Still definitely got it. One more quick one before we let you go. And as a director, and, and, and we know this release to me, you know, because I got one and two, and, and, and as I got to know you or, you know, as I'm getting to know you as well, like, I mean, I, I know you are a, uh, you know, an avid fan of making sure that, um, you know, what you give your, your customers, I guess you could say, um, is, is legit. So um, as we get ready to purchase Tupac Assassination 3 on Amazon, and we get ready to listen to it thoroughly or take a, li- take a look at it and a listen um, to everything thoroughly, what are we going to come away with it, and, and, and how are we going to react once it's over? So we, when we take a listen to it and a look at it, and when it's done, how, how are we as Tupac fans going to walk away from this feeling? Okay. Well, before before I answer that, there was one thing I wanted to I wanted to put out there. You, you know, you, you, this has been a great a great interview. I, I enjoy sit down and just talking heart to heart with people about you know what what's good and what's current and what 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 makes what makes sense. You know what matters. And right. you know, I heard it said. I heard it said, and then this isn't the first time I've heard it said. But there are certain people that want to say, "Oh, R.J. Bond's just out there." And he's got to put this down and do this because he just has to sell some DVDs, okay? Well, mm-hmm. you know, Mike Dorsey hit it on the head when he said, when you make documentary movies, you are not in it for the money. Trust me on that one. You are not in it for the money. Uh, okay. you are, you're, most of the time, you're lucky if you get back your production and marketing costs. You're lucky if you do. Uh, right. You know, we we have not made a fortune on the – uh, on the assassination movies, not not by a long shot. Uh, you know, I still got a job. I still do what I do. I still take other projects and work on other projects to keep the light bills paid. And that doesn't. That's mm-hmm. no reflection on the material. That's just the nature of a documentary. So I find Absolutely. it funny that the same people that are saying that I'm trying to make a buck off of Tupac will, in the same breath, tell you the documentaries don't make any money because both of them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, there's, hey, there's and, no and, and we heard that recently. That, we we, hey, yeah. we heard that same comment recently, right? I'm just saying. Yeah, you did. So, and and when the same person that says that turns around and says that R.J. Bond's just out there trying to make a buck and sell a few more DVDs, uh, well, you know, there's no money in documentaries. So we just we do what we do because it's important. I mean, I lost Frank Alexander. I like we didn't even talk about Russ Poole, but I lost Russ Poole, and Russ Poole right now his name is being drugged through the dirt. And wow. it and it and it makes me mad. Russ Poole and I were very close friends, um, you know, and and uh, uh, you know, personal close friends. And and so to lose two of my close friends related to these projects and the subject matter, 
you know, that's another claim that I have that not, I don't think anybody else has. Okay. I haven't, seen, I haven't seen other other filmmakers lose their two best co-producing partners. Okay. Who also happen to be key, key players in the investigation. You know, um, I haven't seen that happen. So, uh, you know, I, I, I stick in this, I stick in this because of my friends. I stick in this because it, I want to find out what the hell happened. And why? And and so you know because I think it I think it's for my friends, and it's you know it's about the truth at the end of the day. And I'm just and, not gonna stop till we get to it. And, and I think that yeah. uh, as we as we uh, as we close, I think the, the the truth is all we all we can keep searching for, and especially when you're when you're talking about this particular person that happened during that particular time. And the reasons why, and the reasons for it, and and such a and I mean, RJ, let's keep it real, man. I mean, you know that death just turned a lot of different things. It really kind of like turned music in in, in a different direction. Um, and Changed everything, the outlaws man. were it's never pretty- the outlaws again because so many people not just lost their lives. You know, we 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 lost Gaddafi, we lost Fatal. Uh, you know, you know, like the last year or so, but I mean, just a lot of careers changed. A lot of people lost a lot of different things based on his death, and you know, and and that's why I think, man, it's hard for uh, a lot of us to kind of let go of the fact that it was such a you know unnecessary death that people are still trying to yep. hold on anything that has something to do with life. You know what I mean? That yep. is. This, don't forget, you know, the unknown don't, still gives it life. You feel me? So it's different now. It's, it feels different. Well, don't forget Big Psych. Don't forget Big Psych. And, and too, Big Psych. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Rest in peace. You know, yep. um, but, you know, I, you, you asked a question, and I'll tell you that I don't want anybody that watches this movie thinking that they're going to come away with a happy ending. Okay? okay. The, the truth, like I said before, I talked about an inconvenient truth. The truth isn't always pleasant. The truth isn't always convenient. The truth may cause you to lose a little sleep at night. It may cause you to think a little bit more. But I I, I don't want to make a movie with a happy ending if it's not the truth. You know, I don't want to blame the dead guy just because it's convenient to do that. Right. You know, and, and so when you ask me how are people going to come away when they watch this movie, I think people are going to be profoundly changed in the way that they look at the entire investigation – and I think that they're going to not – I don't think they're going to be happy, and I think there's going to be a call for more work, more investigation, more uh, more searching. And mm-hmm. and if that's the case, then, then I've done my job. But, uh, but I, don't, I don't want anybody that rents us – you're going to love the movie. Don't get me wrong. You're going to love the movie. But right. at the end of the day, you may come out of the movie, um, you know, changed. Because I think this is probably the most transparent work that I've done. Um, I think it's it's the biggest. I mean, w- when we sat down to do this movie, my distributor kept yelling at me because I couldn't keep it under two hours. This movie's two and a half hours now. So when we're hey. talking about getting, to it, we get down to it, and and so I just want you know the the, the listeners to know that that. They're going to get their dollars worth of every single second of this movie. We got hundreds of pages of documents that people have never seen before. We have stories from people nobody's ever heard before. And again, enough of the talk. Put up the doc. Mm, there you go. And in closing, I want everybody to make sure you go and pre-order. Go to Amazon. Make sure you go ahead and pre-order Tupac Assassination 3, Battle for Compton. It's available for pre-order if you go to Amazon. And if you do it right now, uh, make sure you go ahead and and hashtag uh, Tupac Assassination Battle for Compton. Do it on Twitter, Facebook. Do it on all social media outlets. Uh, do it and also slash tag Next Legacy. And uh, just just make sure we grow this. And uh, RJ, I want you to come back the the day after the release so we can kind of go a little bit deeper as well. Take phone calls in that process. So I'm inviting you back live on the air. So you know we got. Hundreds of thousands of listeners globally. So once we put this on YouTube, I know it's gonna, uh, you know, spark a lot of conversation. But 
I want you to make a return uh, once it's released so we can be able to talk also. Happy to do it, man. Just set the time. I'm there. Man, I appreciate you. Thanks for taking the time. Hey, you, you gave me a lot to think about and to process. And, you know, from, from an interviewer to an interviewee, um, hey, you dropped the mic on me a few times, so I got I to gotta process this whole thing, man. So I appreciate you. <laughs> All right, brother. And, and, again, if anybody, we do have a Facebook page up for Assassination Battle for Compton. If anybody's got any questions at all, they can just jump up to Facebook for Battle for Compton and go look at it and throw it out there. I don't, I don't block anybody from my Facebook page. If you give me a question I don't like or I can't handle, I'll tell you I don't like it or I can't handle it, but I do not block anybody from my Facebook page. So, so ask whatever questions you have, please. There you go. RJ, appreciate you keeping it real, and I will be talking to you soon, and uh, I know our listeners will, will definitely be looking forward to, uh, you know, asking you some questions as well once uh, once this is released and they've had a chance to view it. So thanks again, man. Continue to keep doing okay, what you're man. doing. I know I know it's a gigantic task, and, and, and I know you're taking on a huge thing, and I appreciate you taking the time out. Thanks, brother. We'll talk soon, man. Take care. A- absolutely. Appreciate the man, the director for Tupac Assassinations 1, 2, and the third one, which is available again. Pre-order it. Go to Amazon. Whew. Take phone calls. Emails. Keep them coming right here. Next, Legacy Radio, Tupac Culture Radio.